Hey guys. So it's been a great weekend, hasn't it? So before Devin comes and talks, Phoebe and I are gonna speak on our stories and just like everything that's we've been through. And yeah. So I was born to a really great family, a mom, a dad, a brother, a sister. Um, I'm always the baby of the family. My sister and brother are significantly older than me. Um, I'm an average child. I like sports. I like music. I love going to church. Just like, I'm just your average kid. Um, I have always considered myself a Methodist, even though I was part of a different denomination for the first couple months of my life, but I don't remember any of that. So um, I grew up going to church. Um, we lived in Batesville for a while, then moved back to BB, Arkansas, where my people are at right now. Um, I started going through the motions, going to church on Sunday, going to eat with family after, going to church on Wednesday, fellowshipping, having fun with the youth group and everything. Um, but then I like actually got into youth group at BB with my youth minister, Virginia Brown up there. And this youth group allowed me to grow in ways that like I never thought I could. I got involved with coming to CCYM events. Refuge was the second event I ever went to. And it's kind of where I decided that I wanted to have a personal relationship with Christ and that I wanted to be that person that could show Christ to others. And so, like, I know a lot of people see me as a person that, like, is strong. I hide my feelings a lot. Like, I don't talk about what I'm going through a lot. There's only certain people that I talk to. I don't, I'm not super open, but like through growing and coming to these CCYM events, I've learned to talk about my struggles more. Like um, about nine years ago, my sister graduated college, moved away, haven't seen her since, lost all contact with her. She is down somewhere in the Grand Canyon right now with a husband and we haven't talked to her since then. Um, I know she's happy, but it's been hard not having a sister there to be there. Um, and then through my youth group, we lost a friend through cancer and that was a really hard time because like she was one of my best friends and it was just all the heartbreak leading up to it and after that, but I had a youth group there to stick it out with me and now I remember her in ways that like, just honor her and everything. And yeah, I've never been more broken in my life at that moment because I've never lost someone that close to me. I've lost family members and stuff, but nothing has hit worse than a youth member that was one of my best friends. Um, but yeah, I have learned through all those struggles that God is always gonna be there through the fight, that he's chosen me to be on his team and, but like, in return, I have to choose him to be on my team so that he'll always be there for me. And my life has been happy. Hello. Okay. <laughs> um, but my life is happier and fuller, and I have so many memories that like have made it so much better through all the struggles I've been through. Um, I don't give up. I know God's not going to give up on me. I know that I'm chosen. I know that I'm loved. It's hard to remind myself of that sometimes, but I have to keep that in mind, and I really hope all of y'all keep that in mind too, because. It's one of the best feelings to have, knowing that there's someone walking with you through everything. Um, and 
I'm really bad about like overthinking, having anxiety about disappointing others because I hate doing that. I hate making people upset with me. Um, if I do, I'm like breaking down. It's just horrible. But that's something I have to know that like it happens. Um, and I have to push through that. I have to remember that God's always there and I'm loved, and I hope all of y'all remember that too. Thanks. Hey guys, so my name is Phoebe. I'm from Pulaski Heights in Little Rock. And I'm gonna talk to y'all for a few minutes this morning. So all weekend, we've been talking about how God chooses each one of us for a specific purpose, but sometimes it can be hard to realize or discern what that purpose is. Think about what you wanted to be when you grew up, when you were five. I've, it's probably different from what it is now. I went from wanting to be a marine biologist to a police officer to now going into ministry and working in the church. But lots of aspects of my life have changed throughout the times when I wanted when I was figuring out when I wanted my future job to be. And I hope that this weekend, God has, realized, God has made you realize that there are so many people in your life who will help you along the journey and that it's okay to not be certain about what the future holds for you. I used to be super, super shy when I was in sixth and seventh grade. And I remember my first refuge six years ago, I didn't have a cell phone. And I just, the only thing that I knew was that I was on a dark, huge charter bus because Pulaski Heights takes a charter bus. And I was going down a winding road and I had no idea what was in store for me. But now, four years later, after the ninth grade bonfire and being on task force last year to now being chair, I am so amazed as what, at what God has done with my journey and the confidence that he has instilled in me. I cared too much about what others thought of me, and I was too busy being a people pleaser to be a God pleaser. I remember when I was in seventh grade, my mom took me to Walgreens and asked me to run inside and get Tic Tacs, but I started crying because I didn't want to talk to the person in the store. And now here I am talking in front of all of you. Throughout my faith journey, God has molded me into a person who isn't afraid to speak up for what is right and strives to be unapologetically confident. And now all I wanna do with my life is make sure that other people feel the love that God has for them and to spread his love in every way that I can. So this weekend, I hope that you have found strength and courage to go back into school or work in your everyday lives and be kind to people. And remember that you were chosen for a specific purpose in this life and that you are always loved. Thank you. What's up, guys? I have never used one of these mics before. I just realized that. This is weird. I feel weird with this thing. All right, so my name is Adam. I am from Conway, Conway First. I know we have some Conway people here. Um, I grew up in Maumelle, moved to Conway when I was about 12, went to Maumelle First for a long time. So what's up, guys? Yeah. So I'm here to tell you a little bit about my story. So for me, it really begins two summers ago in a doctor's office at Arkansas Children's. And I had just been diagnosed with juvenile arthritis, which I thought was an old people disease. It's not. And a medicine-resistant pain disorder called amplified pain syndrome, which is exactly what it sounds like. And so this diagnosis meant that I'll be spending the rest of my life in constant pain physically. And so I was hurt, I was upset, and I began to blame God for this. I began to blame God for making me disabled I had to go in a wheelchair, I had to walk with a cane. And as we've talked about being chosen this week, I realized that God, to me, it felt like he had chosen me last, but in the game of life, you know? A little bigger stakes than ninth grade basketball gym class, you know, basketball in gym class. It really seemed like he had left me purposeless. But as our theme verse, Deuteronomy 7, 6 says, God always chooses us, and he chooses us first. To 
fulfill our purpose, right? So as I struggle through my treatment to this day to function normally, I've realized that God has always chose me first, even if it doesn't feel like it. He chose to make me struggle through the pain I have to feel to show me that anything I set my mind to is possible. He chose to show me his love and grace to other people like me, people who feel like God chose them last. So as I invite Rev Dev up to come speak, I'd just like to say that if you don't feel a purpose yet, know that God, with time, and if you open your heart, will show you your purpose. Can you all give a hand for Rev Dev? He's doing a great job. Hey, can we, whoa, that volume can come way down because I talk really loud. Um, hey, real quick, while I kind of get stuff that I need to get set up, um, can we give a hand for our task force again? They've done an incredible job this weekend and last weekend. And speaking from experience, like, it is not easy to... Um, plan and help plan and be a part of a huge event like this and they have done such a killer job and so I'm so thankful for them. Have you all had a great weekend? Yeah. Awesome. Me as well. It's been uh, such a privilege to be with you all here and uh, I'm so excited for this morning. Don't worry, we're not going to light it. I know, sad day. It's just a visual. I'm a visual person, so whatever can help me remember stuff, I try to do things like that because I figure some of you might be visual like me. All right, so first things first, I forgot to do this last weekend, and I was really sad. I'm going to get a picture of all of you because I want to remember. So if I could, if you could maybe turn on the lights just a hair because the iPhone isn't great at night or in the dark. And so if you want to make a funny face, whatever you want to do. I'm going to get a picture of you all. One real fast camera action. Some of you are like, that was way too fast. That never is going to work. <laughs> Bless you. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm so glad that we are here. Unfortunately, this is the last day that we have together. Sad face and sigh. I don't know what else. Um, but we do get to go back home to our real beds, and that is cause for celebration. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Um, but uh, I've so enjoyed getting to know some of you better. Had a ton of fun playing some sports and different things with you all. Uh, last night watching The Lion King, the best intro ever. I mean, you can't beat that song. Then I went to the dance party, and y'all were having a blast there. And then I went to bed because I needed to go to bed. Actually, that's not true. Then I went back to the cabin, and we did Harry Potter trivia until way too late. I'm sorry that you weren't invited. I should have invited you, whoever gasped so uh, deeply there. But, so this morning, let's stand together, because it's Sunday morning, and uh, hundreds and millions of people are gathered in churches all around the world today. And so as you stand... This weekend, remember, we've been looking at how we've been chosen by God. It's been our theme, talking about identity. We've been looking at the theme verse in Deuteronomy that talks about how we're chosen, but also in 1 Peter. And so this morning, we're going to look at the life of Peter, because as I said last night, Peter writes a book reminding people of their identity in Christ, and I think it's important to take a look at Peter's life because I think so much of what Peter writes in his letter is from his personal experience. And so, today we'll be in John 21, 1 through 3. So this is the reading of God's Word. Later, Jesus appeared to the disciples, 
beside the Sea of Galilee. Later, meaning this was after Jesus went to the cross, died, and rose again. So Jesus is now appearing to them after the resurrection beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there, Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. Peter said, Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. And then verses 15 through 19. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know that I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know that I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. And this is the word of God for the people of God. And we say together, thanks be to God. All right, you can go ahead and find a seat. So, here we have this incredible interaction between Jesus and Peter that I think can teach us so much about our relationship with Christ, about our lives and what God thinks about each and every one of us today. And so that's kind of the big idea for this morning. It's been the big idea of this weekend, and it's this question, what does God think of me? And so for some of us, maybe you came into this weekend and that question, it carried with it a lot of weight. For whatever reason, maybe this weekend you've been hearing all about your identity in Christ, that God has chosen you. But for whatever reason in your heart, it just kind of carries with it maybe some doubt or disbelief that, again, I'll never measure up. I'll never be good enough for Jesus. Maybe it's some regret and some things that you've done that Jesus is simply shaking his head in disappointment of you and you want to follow him but you're just not sure you're good enough well I want to close this weekend by looking at the life of Peter by reminding us that there is good news for each and every one of us and we see it so much in Peter's life but in order to understand the full weight of this conversation between Jesus and Peter we have to understand their relationship. We, had to, we have to rewind their lives and, and figure out what led this conversation between Jesus and Peter in, in this idea of, do you love me? Yes, I love you. And so we've got to figure out what the, the relational and emotional tension that goes into this conversation about their love for one another. And so if you didn't know, Peter was this kind of act first, a really brash kind of boisterous dude, loud, uh, some theologians say middle class business person who only knew one thing, fishing. How many of you feel like you know fishing pretty well? Like you're pretty good fisher people, <laughs> fishermen and fisher women. <laughs> And so that's Peter. Peter only knew fishing. That was his entire purpose until one day Jesus came along by the, by the seashore and they're out there and on the boats and uh, they're, they're standing there and Jesus plucked him from his boat and gave him a purpose, gave him a future, gave Peter a purpose and a future that he never could have imagined. And it's that moment where Jesus calls Peter to be a disciple. Come and follow me. And Peter drops everything. He forgets this fishing life, and Jesus says, hey, I'm going to make you a fisher of people. And so he leaves it all behind to follow Jesus. Well, fast forward a little bit in Peter's life, and Peter was the disciple that when Jesus told him he would fall away, like Jesus told Peter, hey, you're going to deny me. Peter rose up with some really good intentions but kind of a self-righteous kind of way and was like, no, Jesus, not me. Not me. I love you more than anyone here. I love you more than everyone. I'll never fall away, Jesus. And as I read through that, I think it's not too different from us when we come away from a retreat like this. We kind of get our batteries recharged like we talked about last night. 
And we think, man, not me. I'll never fall away. We get recharged from places like this. And we're like, this is me. I'm just going to keep on following Jesus with all of my heart. It's never going to change. Not me, Jesus. I love you more than everyone. I have an experience like this. Uh, I went to a camp when I was not too, a little bit older than you all. I was sometime in high school. And when I was in high school, this will remind you that I'm a little bit older than you all. I listened to music on what we call CDs. Um, we didn't stream music. We didn't need internet. It, uh, but I had a case that was about this thick, and it was a double zipper CD case, and it probably carried maybe 150 CDs in it. So anyways, I had gone to this youth camp, and I, I had been a little bit convicted of some of the CDs that I owned, the music that really wasn't that great. I probably shouldn't listen to it. It was filled with all kinds of bad language and whatnot. And so I got home just kind of on this spiritual high, and I was like, okay, I need to do something about this. And so I got home. I grabbed my huge CD case, and I don't know what was going through my mind, but I went out and I took the CD case to my front yard. And I opened the CD case and I began to flip through the CDs and like, okay, this one's okay. This one's probably okay. And then I get to one that I was like, eh, I don't think I should listen to that. And I would pull it out and uh, take it out of its CD sleeve and just chuck it across the neighborhood. I don't know what I was thinking. It's really bad for the environment. Like, I'm just littering. I don't, I don't know. But it was kind of like Peter in this moment. Like, I just had this idea, like, yes, here we go. I'm going to do this. And so I got home, and I just chucked a CD, chuck a CD. And I probably threw, I don't know, 10 CDs, maybe more, throughout my neighborhood into my neighbor's lawns, into their, like, garden beds. Like, if a neighbor saw me from, like, the window, they're probably like, this kid is the craziest kid in the world. Like, I don't know what went through me. But, and, and so this is a funny example, but this is Peter in this moment, right? Like, he's kind of on that spiritual camp high. He's, Jesus tells him, hey, you're going to deny me. You're going to fall away. And, and Peter responds to Jesus like, no, not me, Jesus. I love you more than anything. And then before the night was over, he would deny Jesus three times. You see, Peter was the one who, when Jesus told them his true purpose, when Jesus told the disciples that, hey, my true purpose is to go to the cross, to die and raise, to be raised to life, like that's my true purpose, Peter was like, no, no way I'm going to let that happen, Jesus. And Peter actually ends up rebuking Jesus, like not really a great idea in my opinion, but that's what Peter does. He said, no way I'm going to allow that to happen. Peter was the one in the Garden of Gethsemane when the time has finally come for Jesus to sacrifice his life for us. That they're in the garden. They're, the people have come to arrest Jesus. And Peter pulls out his fishing knife and cuts off one of the guard's ears. Like, no, we're not letting this happen tonight. Like, Peter was all about his own plan, what he thought was great ideas, this passionate, rash, act first, think later kind of of person. And then Peter arrives at one of his greatest moments of testing. Jesus has now gone before the officials for his trial, and he's being questioned about whether he's guilty or not. Pilate's trying to figure out what to do with this Jesus person. And meanwhile, Peter is outside of the city gates, and it's in John chapter 18, and I'll read this story. And if you're a visual person, just try to picture this uh, imagery with me, because I think it's, it, it, it sets the scene so well. Peter had to stay outside of the gate. Then the disciples who knew the high priest spoke to the woman watching the gate, and she let Peter in. And then the woman asked Peter, you're not one of that man's disciples, are you? No, Peter said, I am not. And then because it was cold, the household servants and the guards, they made a charcoal fire. And they stood around it, warming themselves. And so they're all just standing there around this fire, warming themselves. Meanwhile, as Peter was standing by the fire, warming himself, they asked again, Hey, you're not one of the disciples, are you? And he denied it again, saying, no, I am not. But then one of the household servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had just cut off, like 
this guy's going to forget who Peter was? Like, dude, you just cut off my cousin's ear. Like, I'm not going to forget who you are. And Peter again said, and, and, and so this person, the cousin of the, the guard that who had his ear cut off, says, didn't I see you out there in the olive grove with Jesus? Weren't you out there in the garden? And again, Peter denied it. And immediately the rooster crowed. And if you remember, that's what Jesus told Peter. Jesus told Peter, hey, before the rooster crows in the morning, you'll deny me three times. And immediately the rooster crowed. And I just imagine Peter just runs away as he weeps, realizing that he has just betrayed one of his best friends and his Savior. That Peter's now completely turned his back on Jesus. And I just imagine Peter is left wondering, what does Jesus think about me now? And Peter ends up letting this shame and this guilt torment him so much that he goes back to his former life before meeting Jesus. Like Peter just goes back to regular fishing. Like, I don't know about this whole Jesus thing. I'm just going to go back to my normal life, my normal routine, and completely give up on being chosen. Completely give up on the purpose that Jesus had for me. I'm, I'm done with that. And he abandoned all the other disciples and went back to his former way of living. And so then Jesus went to the cross and rose again. And an angel of the Lord appeared to a person named Mary at the tomb, the empty tomb, and said, Go, tell the disciples, including Peter, that Jesus will meet them in Galilee. And so what's going on here is that now Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is going to return and meet with his disciples to show them that he truly was the son of God. And so this angel appears to Mary and says, hey, go tell the disciples, including Peter. Including Peter, meaning that the disciples might not have invited Peter along. The disciples might not have included him in the first place. Peter probably didn't think he was welcome as a disciple anymore because of what he had done. But God had still chosen Peter. God had still chosen Peter for a purpose, by purpose, and on purpose. And God's unstoppable love was not finished with Peter yet. And so we fast forward into the story, and we find that Peter has come along. Like, he's decided, okay, yeah, I'll rejoin the disciples. He's joined the other disciples by the lake. After all, we're just fishing. Like, this is no big deal. And so after they're fishing their nets into the sea, and they haven't caught anything, into Peter's guilt and shame walks Jesus, his Savior, and then recreates the very miracle which Peter had first been called to be a fisher of people. And so imagine with me the, the lake, the very spot on the shore, the boats with the fishing nets. All of these things would have brought Peter back to that day that had been the turning point of his life. And Peter is still filled with guilt and shame, wondering what would Jesus think of him now. Now, there's a part of this story that I find really comical, and so I wanted to read it to you all because, again, this kind of helps us see what kind of act first, th think later kind of person um, Peter was. And so in John 21, right before we have this story of the interaction with Peter and Jesus, we get the story of Peter realizing that it's Jesus and running to Jesus. And so here's what happens. In 21, verse 7, and I don't have this on the screens, just listen uh, with me. Um, it says this. Then the disciple, Jesus loved, said to Peter, hey, it is the Lord. And when Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, jumped into the water, and headed to shore. So first off, in this funny, wild story, Peter actually gets dressed to jump into the water, like, that doesn't really make a ton of sense. Uh, and so he gets dressed to jump into the water. But then this is the part that really cracks me up. The others stayed with the boat and rowed the boat to shore. They pulled the loaded net to shore for they were only about 100 yards from the shore. Now, I don't know about y'all, but swimming 100 yards is not the easiest thing in the world, right? Like, Peter, it would have been so much faster to stay in the boat 
and stay with the disciples and row to shore, but not Peter. He was like, I got to get out and swim to Jesus. And I love the, the passage of scripture here because the other disciples are like, hey, uh, Peter got out of the boat and swam to Jesus. Like, that's Peter. That's just who he was. The rest of us, we just rowed, you know. We're just, we're just going to keep rowing. And so Peter goes to Jesus, and he runs to meet Jesus, his Savior. And one can only imagine that he's running to meet Jesus because he, he can't wait to apologize. But I imagine there's just a little bit of nervous excitement there, right? Like the Savior is alive, and that is cause for rejoicing. And yet, one can only imagine the nervousness of Peter because, yes, the Savior is alive, but Peter hasn't seen Jesus since he's denied him three times. And finally, Peter gets to the shore, and he meets with Jesus. And Jesus is there standing over a charcoal fire. The only time we see this phrase, a charcoal fire, and this word in Scripture is recalls us to the very night of which Peter denied Jesus three times. And Peter, I just imagine spotting the fire of coals before Jesus. I can only imagine the realization that hits Peter like a ton of bricks. Jesus knows. Jesus knows what I've done. And all of the burning thoughts of guilt and shame are running through his mind. And so this is the emotional and relational tension in history that Peter brings into our story. And so we go back to 15 through 17. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, then feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, then tend my sheep. And he said a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter felt hurt because he asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. So Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And you see the very question that has been killing Peter. I wonder what Jesus thinks of me now. Jesus takes the question and flips it and instead asks Peter, no, what do you think of me? What do you think of me? And here's the best part. In Peter's greatest moment of failure, Jesus doesn't withdraw his relationship from Peter. Instead, Jesus runs towards Peter and meets him exactly where he is. Jesus, in his perfect love, nothing could stop him from showing the love that he had for Peter. Here, Peter had just denied Jesus three times around a charcoal feeling. Imagine all of the feelings that went into this, that along with the breakfast, meeting here we have Peter around the fire and he would have immediately been drawn back to the memory of what he considered to be his greatest failure the place he messed up most and yet Jesus calmly walks him through the memory do you love me first Peter doesn't get it of course I love you Jesus then feed my sheep the second time, do you love me? And I imagine Peter's getting a little bit more cautious here. Like, oh, oh, what do you mean, Jesus? You just asked me the same question. Like, yes, of course I love you. Maybe it's starting to feel a little bit more familiar. Uh, Jesus, I don't want to go down this road. Then tend my sheep, Peter. And then when Jesus asks Peter one more time, I can almost hear the rooster crowing in Peter's mind. And in that moment, Peter realizes what's going on. Jesus is meeting Peter in his greatest failure, taking it head on and replacing his guilt and his shame with love and forgiveness and restoration. Almost as if to say to Peter, hey, Peter, this relationship, it is never closed. You can never run too far away from me. The question, Peter, isn't what do I think of you, for that is unchanging. I have always chosen you. I will always choose you. But rather, the question is what do you think of me? And you see, this is our story. 
It's my story. It's your story in the midst of our shame when we mess up, when we feel like there's no way God could love us and we're left wondering after our failures, what does God think of me? We need to remember this story. We need to remember moments and weekends like this in our lives. We need to remember our true identity. That just like Peter, we can come running to Jesus because Jesus' unstoppable love for us, it never changes. Jesus always chooses us. Jesus always says yes to us. And it's as if Jesus is telling us that this relationship is always open. No matter where you find yourself, no matter what you've done, Jesus is always looking to remind you of your purpose. And if you don't know the end of Peter's story, Peter actually became one of the greatest leaders in the history of the church. Jesus, in the midst of everything that Peter had done, sends Peter on Jesus' mission. You see, this is more than just a restoration. This is another calling for Peter. You see, we are chosen, we are changed, we are called and then we are sent by Jesus. Right before Peter and Jesus have this conversation, Jesus has just fed his disciples, and this is an invitation into Jesus' mission. He's telling Peter that, hey, just as I have loved and cared for you, just as I have treated you, now go and do the same for my people. Go and feed my sheep. My mission is now your mission. My sheep are now your sheep. Even in your imperfections, even in your doubts, even in your sin, I'm in inviting you in. I'm telling you that my mission is your mission. I mean, how crazy is that, y'all? Like Jesus, in the midst of all of our imperfections, trusts us with such great purpose. And I think so many of us, we shy away from God's call in our life because, yeah, being comfortable is easier. Yeah, blending in is a lot easier at times. Having control of our lives is easier at times. But I think the real issue that we constantly wrestle with is walking through our life just like Peter, wondering, what does God think of me now? And we need to remind ourselves that it's the wrong question. Rather, the question is, do you love Jesus? Because he loves you so much. A band's going to come up to, uh, this morning and play softly underneath us. And I just want to close our time together by making space for some prayer. We've talked about it all weekend long, about how you are chosen. Each and every one of you are chosen by God day in and day out, that we have identity because he chooses us first. But just like in our story this morning, Jesus is waiting for you to answer the same question that he asked of Peter. Do you love me? And so this morning, I just want to make time to respond to the Lord in prayer. And I just want to guide us through a time of prayer. So if you could just close your eyes with me this morning. I'm just going to guide us through a time of prayer. Maybe this weekend, something has been stirring in you all weekend long. You can't really put language to what it is, but you want to make a, a next step of some kind in your Christian faith. For some of you, it may be a time of repentance. Maybe it's a time to confess to the Lord some specific areas of sin in your life that the Lord has been revealing to you this weekend. Maybe they've gotten in the way of your relationship with Jesus. And so if that's you, then I want you to be reminded of God's free grace for each of us.
Maybe some of you have been following Jesus, but you want to step into a, a further growth, if you will. Maybe God's calling you to step into leadership. Maybe it's to step out in faith and to ask someone older to walk alongside you and disciple you. If that's you, would you just take the next 10 to 15 seconds and ask the Lord to give you wisdom, give you wisdom in what he might be calling you to and to reveal someone in your life whose relationship with Jesus inspires you. Just spend some time in prayer for the next 10 to 15 seconds here. Some of you, maybe the extent of your faith has been really to just kind of please your parents. Maybe you did confirmation and you said yes to Jesus, and now the Lord has been revealing more to you about what that really means. And maybe you want to choose to make your faith in Jesus your own. If that's you, it can be as simple as praying, Jesus, I, I want to follow you. So would you use this time to talk to Jesus and do that? next 10 to 15 seconds, if that's you. Jesus, we're so thankful that you loved us so much you chose us first. We're thankful for a weekend where we can come, get away, and remind ourselves of our true identity, that we are your children, that just like Peter, your love for us is never closed off. It is never reserved. You are pouring it out for us all of the time. God, we thank you that we are your children, chosen people that have extreme value in your eyes. And so, Lord, we ask that through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would continue the work you are doing in us right now, and you will continue to complete it in us today and tomorrow and in the future, that you would remind us so deeply that we are chosen, that you change us, that you call us, and that you send us. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said... Amen. Let's stand together and sing our closing song this morning.